Okay, very well. So uh, today is the second lecture of the M Center lecture series by Ben Davison. And the special name of his lecture is on the first slide of his, uh, on the first slide. Okay, Ben, please. Okay, thanks again for having me uh, to speak. Um, so in this uh, second talk, my plan is to um, talk about the cohomological Donaldson Thomas theory in um, in two dimensions. So of, of, of a sort of nice two CY category, namely the category of representations of a pre-projective algebra. Um, and I'll talk about it for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, it gives another place where we can prove a somewhat surprising um, instance of the decomposition theorem. Uh, secondly, it's just nice theory. And thirdly, it gives the kind of local um, picture, the local model for the more general two CY categories that we will um, run up against in the final talk when I finally start talking about non-abelian Hodge theory. So the two CY categories of Higgs bundles and representations of fundamental groups. Okay, so here's some, um, yeah. Uh, the, the point is going to be to prove um, the decomposition theorem and also to prove purity. And um, the basic idea is this, if we can prove purity for this category, then we'll, we will sh we'll, we'll prove using the fact that other two CY categories are locally modeled by this category and purity is a local, something you can check locally to, to prove purity more generally. Um, okay, so on with the show. Um, as in the first uh, talk, Q will denote a quiver and I'll um, denote the vertices by Q0 and the arrows by Q1. And S and T stands for source and target, taking me from an arrow to its source and target. Um, we form Q bar by doubling Q. This is, I think, or I hope, the standard notation. Um, so for every arrow in Q, we add another arrow going the other way. And in this way, we form Q bar. And then the pre projective algebra is a uh, quotient of the free path algebra of this doubled quiver algebra. Um, we take the, the quotient by a single relation, the sum over all of the uh, commutators of A with A star. Um, and that there's an example later on this side, which uh, hopefully makes this somewhat clearer. Um, yeah, so a, a representation of the pre-projective algebra I can think of as a representation of the free path algebra of the double equivalent. So, representation of that free path algebra that happens to satisfy these relations. Um, and uh, so I, I naturally think of the stack of representations of uh, the pre-projective algebra as a sub-stack of the stack of representations of the uh, free path algebra of the double quiver. And likewise for the coarse moduli spaces. So uh, all I'm saying in this bullet point is I can just naturally embed these stacks inside these stacks that we met in the first lecture of representations of quivers. And as in the first lecture, I denote by JH <clears throat> for Jordan Holder, the morphism that takes a, um, a module to its semi-simplification. In other words, it takes uh, points of this stack, so modules for uh, pi q, to the direct sum of the subquotients appearing in any Jordan Holder filtration of that module. Um, Okay, so I promised an example, and it's the kind of running running example through all of these talks so far. Um, I start off with the Jordan quiver, which uh, let me recall is the quiver with one vertex and one loop, uh, which I'll call X for the purposes of this example. Um, then in forming the pre-projective algebra, I first double the quiver. Um, so the free path algebra for the doubled quiver is the uh, polynomial algebra in two, two generators, x and x uh, star, where these are non-commuting variables. But then I impose this one relation, I take the sum over all of the arrows of the original quiver, and I take the commutators of the arrow with its star version. And here that's just this single relation, x commutator x star. So this pre-projective algebra winds up being isomorphic to the polynomial algebra in two to commuting variables, where here I've relabeled um, x star with a y. So um, the stack of representations of this 
algebra. Well, this is a commutative algebra. So representations um, for it or modules for it, I can think of as coherent sheaves on the spectrum of that algebra, which in this case is A2. So um, yeah, the stack of d-dimensional modules for this pre-projective algebra is isomorphic to the stack of length d coherent sheaves on A2. Um, and the coarse modulized space, this is less obvious, but um, can be shown. Uh, the coarse modulized space um, is given by uh, the d symmetric power of A2. Um, so how, how to see this? The, the, hmm, there aren't many um, simple representations of uh, the polynomial algebra in two variables. In particular, they're all one dimensional. So when I take the Jordan Holder filtration of a length D module, all of the subquotients will be one dimensional um, and uh, there will be point sheaves. Um, and this morphism JH will just remember what those points are. So it will just spit out um, D points without, without order. Yeah, in other words, JH is the morphism taking a coherent sheaf to its support. Uh, but uh, can it be kind of seen purely uh, algebra geometrically for those who do doesn't like quivers? Like if you have the Jordan quiver, so it corresponds to the uh, torsion shifts representation, same as torsion shifts on the line. And the definition of pre-projective algebra is just a cotangent stack uh, to, to that one. So you get coherent shifts on, on A2. Uh, yeah, you can see it this way. Um, yeah, so a more geometric way of thinking about this, uh, and it's more, it's, an, it's, it's mostly an, an analogy, is that representations of quivers are like coherent sheaves on curves, mm -hmm. and representations of the pre-projective algebra are like coherent sheaves on the total space of the canonical bundle of the curve. In this particular case, it's precisely. Yeah, in this case, it's more than a, it's more than a metaphor. It's an actual fact. Here, um, representations of the Jordan quiver are the same as modules on a particular curve, namely A1, and representations of the pre-projective algebra are coherent sheaves on the total space of the canonical bundle to A1, but that canonical bundle is trivial. So they are coherent sheaves on A1 cross A1 equals A2. Um, but yeah, an, an idea to have in the back of your mind, and it sort of helps from the point of view of understanding why am I calling these things 2CY, is that um, representations of pre-projective algebras are something like, and sometimes actually are, um, coherent sheaves on uh, the total spaces of canonical bundles on curves. So nice um, non-compact 2CY varieties. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so uh, already in, if you allow me to just skip back briefly, already in this example, you see the stack of um, length D coherent sheaves on A2 is very singular. It's really the, the stack of um, pairs of commuting matrices, which is a very interesting, but very singular singularity. Um, and this is the first time I've uh, really gotten into talking about singular spaces. And this, this means that we have to um, make some choices. So if X is a smooth complex variety, then in the first talk, we adopted the notation that X fur is the constant perverse sheaf i.e. the constant sheaf on X shifted so that it's perverse. This is um, Verdier self-dual, and it's also the same as the intersection complex. So there are three cohomology theories on X, um, which are actually all the same. They're all canonically isomorphic. So one can, in the first instance, take the derived direct image along the structure morphism, which is a fancy way of defining the singular cohomology of X, or you can take the derived direct image along the structure morphism of the Verdier dual of this sheaf, or you can take the derived direct image along the structure morphism of the intersection complex. But because the things we're taking the direct image of are all isomorphic, or all, all three of these are, are essentially the same. Um, but for X singular or sufficiently singular, they're all different. 
So we have to decide which cohomology theory we like the best. And the rest of this talk, the rest of this slide, I'm going to say a few words about what we pick and why we pick it. Um, so firstly, to mitigate how weird maybe the middle one looks, i.e. the fact that it involves the dualizing complex might, might not be to everyone's taste. Via the sort of usual six functor yoga, one can commute the S lower star past Verdier duality at the expense of turning it into an S lower shriek. But then S lower shriek of the constant sheaf um, is a fancy way of defining compactly supported cohomology. So really the borel mohr homology as I've defined it is nothing, nothing more exotic than the um, vector dual of the compactly supported cohomology, which might be a little bit more motivated for, for some people. Um, okay, so which one do we choose? Um, so as we saw in the previous slide, the, the stacks that we're considering will generally be singular. And we actually want to take care of those singularities. We, uh, you know, that's somehow the, the fun geometry is wrapped up in these singularities. Um, and so we're going to favor borel more homology over singular cohomology. And the reason is it's not homotopy invariant. It might seem like an odd thing to um, consider as a desirable property, but the point is that um, take the stack that we saw in the previous slide, the stack of commuting matrices, this can be contracted down to a point. So it's homotopic to point mod GLN. Um, Point mod, yeah, point mod GLD. Point mod GLD is a smooth stack. Um, and we want to be able to tell the difference between point mod GLD and the stack of commuting pairs of matrices, uh, because one has got all of that interesting singular structure and one has got very little interesting structure. Um, so that's why we're going to pick Borel more homology. Um, if you think about it, if we were to take the cohomology, then taking the um, Taking the singular cohomology of the stack of d dimensional representations of any pre projective algebra, it doesn't depend on q at all. It just depends on d, which is a, yeah, not, not a very happy place to be. So we take the Borel Moore homology for these reasons um, and for others that I can go into if, if there's time, which there won't be. Um, okay, so we're going to be focusing on Borel Moore homology, which to reiterate, is nothing more strange than the dual of the compactly supported cohomology, um, which we express as the derived direct image of the dualizing complex. Okay, so um, I muttered something in the first talk about how I was going to, in the end, try to get rid of vanishing cycles from the presentation. After all, we care about the cohomology or the borel mohr homology of um, stacks in non-abelian Hodge theory. And in that sentence, there is no no mention of vanishing cycles. So in the end, we've got to make them go away. And the way they go away is via something called dimensional reduction, which is really a sort of geometric um, theorem, lemma, um, that goes as follows. So I've, I've imposed conditions here, which are a little bit stronger than I really need to, but um, they're good for exposition. So let X be a smooth variety given by the product of some smooth variety Y and affine N space. And I'm going to take a function f on x, which is um, weight one with respect to the scaling action on a n, which is um, put more explicitly means that there are a bunch of functions on the base, which I'm calling f i's, um, such that f can be written like so as a sum of products of the coordinates on a n with these functions um, f i. Uh, yeah, so, so you see this, this is a function that has a weight one with respect to the C star action that scales all of the X's. Um, okay, and just some notation. I'm gonna fix Z to be the vanishing locus of all of these FIs. Um, I let Z bar be um, the pre-image of Z under the projection. So this is really um, Z cross A N sitting inside X. Uh, and I is going to be the inclusion of Z bar into X. Okay, so here's the, here's the crunch. Um, the following natural transformation, which I will say some words to explain, is an isomorphism. As long as I apply it to complexes which, are, um, uh, which have constant cohomology along the projection. So put differently, this is an isomorphism, but only if I apply it to complexes which are pulled back 
from Y pulled back along the base so that they're sort of constant along the fibers. Okay, so how do I come up with this? Um, it's part of the definition of the vanishing cycles functor that it admits a um, natural transformation to the restriction to the zero locus of the function f. Um, but z sits inside the zero locus of f, so I can just restrict further to z, and that gives me this uh, natural transformation from phi f to restriction to z, which is i upper star, i lower star, in other words. Um, I take that natural transformation, I push it forward, I sort of lower shriek, push it forward along pi, and the claim is that as long as I started with something that was constant along the fibers of the projection, this morphism becomes an isomorphism. Um, I'm not actually going to use the isomorphism in this exact form. And that's why it's written in a slightly strange way. I've written DA. I'm actually going to take the Verdier dual of that. So all I've done here is applied Verdier duality to the whole thing. Uh, so pi y lower shriek got replaced by pi y lower star. I upper star got replaced by I upper shriek. I lower star stayed the same because um, I lower star is I lower shriek because it's um, a projective morphism. And um, the, the, the vanishing cycle functor is uh, Verdier self dual, so I don't have to do anything there. Um, okay, so this is the statement that um, this natural transformation is an isomorphism. Um, okay, so how we use it throughout this talk is uh, the following. So remember, um, the Borel Moore homology is given by taking the derived global sections of the dualizing complex. The dualizing complex is a slightly, slightly tricky thing to get one's hands on, but one way to do it is you take I upper shriek of the constant sheaf from a, along a smooth embedding. That's again via the sort of yoga of the six functor formalism that, that'll do it for you. Um, so I've just written that here that I upper shriek of the constant sheaf on X gives me up to a Tate twist. So this is, um, yeah. It's not left, it's, it's Tate. Hmm? Yeah. It, L is T or what? Uh, uh, I've, yeah, so I've, I've written it um, explicitly ah, okay. brackets down here. Yeah, so it's um, it's a pure mixed Hodge structure. It sits in cohomological degree two. It's pure of weight two. Um, so in, in other words, it's the compactly supported cohomology of A1, but it has underlying vector space Q sitting in cohomological degree two. Um, Okay, so bearing this in mind, if I apply alpha, this natural transformation alpha to the constant sheaf on X or the constant mixed Hodge module on X, I get this isomorphism. I get that the dualizing complex on Z up to a tape twist, which I've not bothered to specify, is isomorphic to the push forward along the projection of the vanishing cycles of F. Um, so yeah, here's, you know, here's really the crunch that I can get between the dualizing complex, which is what gives us Borel-Moore homology and um, vanishing cycles via dimensional reduction. Um, so let me, I mean, yeah, this might, this might seem a little bit abstract. So um, let me go back to my running example. So um, running example is stuff that's built out of the Jordan quiver. Um, so um, I set Q to be, or Q tilde to be the quiver with three loops, X, Y, and Z. Um, and set f to be this function. I take the trace of x commutator yz, which um, is a function on the stack of representations of this quiver. So this uses cyclic invariance of the trace. Um, and as I mentioned in the first talk, the critical locus of this function f is cut out by the equations saying that the three, um, the three loops commute. So in other words, um, as a substack of the stack of representations of the three loop quiver, the critical locus is given by the stack of representations of um, the polynomial algebra in three commuting variables. Uh, yeah. And um, as I mentioned again in the first talk, the support of the vanishing cycles is the critical locus of the function. The, one's meant to think of the vanishing cycles as being um, a sheaf that tells us how singular the zero locus of my function is. So as a sort of first approximation to that, it's supported on the critical locus. Um, okay. And as I mentioned in the first uh, lecture, somehow the, the, principal, the principal objects in the 
cohomological DT theory of A3 is the cohomology of this sheaf, the cohomology of these vanishing cycles. Um, okay, so now let Q bar be the double of the Jordan quiver. So uh, a quiver with two loops, X and Y. And I let pi, um, and pi is the same pi as the previous side, um, pi be the projection given by the forgetful morphism. So if I have a representation of the three loop quiver, I get a representation of the two loop quiver by just forgetting the action of the third loop Z. And then the dimensional reduction isomorphism tells us, and now I have been a bit more careful with my uh, shifts, this is actually correct, um, that the dualizing complex on the stack of representations of the pre-projective algebra or the polynomial algebra in two variables here, um, is isomorphic to the direct image of the vanishing cycles for this function on this space here. So um, yeah, the way to see this is, um, well, Z, capital Z from the previous slide was given by, um, well, uh, it's given by writing out my function um, as a bunch of functions on the base, as a bunch of functions on um, the stack of representations of the double quiver times functions on the sort of projection times coordinates. Those coordinates are given by the matrix entries of my third matrix Z. Um, I realize there's an unfortunate clash, clash of notation there. Um, and when I set all of those functions to be zero, I'm imposing that X and Y commute. Um, so this follows straight from dimensional reduction. And then if I just take the um, derived global sections of this isomorphism, Remember, the borel moore homology is just defined to be the derived global sections of the dualizing complex. And um, so, yeah, I get, I get this. That the, the, the thing on the right is kind of the principal object of study in degree zero cohomological Donaldson Thomas theory. And it's isomorphic to the borel moore homology of the stack of representations on A2 or modules over this pre projective algebra. And this is where the name comes from, by the way. On the left-hand side, I'm looking at um, a stack of objects in a kind of two-dimensional category. And on the right-hand side, I'm looking at the vanishing cycle cohomology of a stack of objects in a three-dimensional category. So from A2 to A3. So in passing from 3D to 2D, what we've done is we've traded a complicated sheaf, the sheaf of vanishing cycles that is more or less impossible to calculate, um, for an elementary sheaf, the constant sheaf, one couldn't really ask for anything nicer than that. But at a cost, the cost is that where before we had a nice smooth space, something like the stack of representations of a quiver, we now have some horribly singular space. But the, the trade turns out to be a good one. Um, and by somehow working both sides of the trade, we can prove strong theorems. Well, in this particular case, what's a wide two dimension? I mean, uh... You just get rid of the sheaf of vanishing cycles. That's it. And but the spaces are more or less of the same cost. 3D, 3D or 2D, three-dimensional space plane or two-dimensional plane. So in this particular yeah. case, I mean this singularity is not quite visible. Yeah. Well, on the right hand side, I've written this as a sheaf on the stack of representations of the um polynomial algebra in three variables. But one other way that I have been writing it is as a sheaf on um, the stack of representations of the tripled quiver. It's just that it happens to be supported on this, on this sub-stack. But um, when writing down, for example, the definition of the Koha, we just considered the vanishing cycle sheaf as a sheaf on the nice singular spaces of representations of quivers. And um, you know, one buys certain things that way, like Umker maps and Verdier self-duality and so on. Um, I guess the question yeah, was asking, here you have a plane, you have a uh, three space, which one is the very singular space? Which one is? The, on a very singular space, you... No, no, no. Uh, 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 so the point is that the critical locus for F is... Singular. Quite... Singular, yeah, but the main yeah. thing is that the right hand side is uncomputable. This sheaf of vanishing cycles, yeah, it's not computable. It's, it's um, some, if you remember the definition, so you you would be happy not to see it. I see, yeah, the I the space, that's synchronous, right? Uh, 
on the left hand side you do not have any shift you you have just cosmology of whatever you got mm -hmm. after this dimension but the with coefficients in the constant shift so um, if you can compute them that's that's it mm. so it's much much easier the left hand side it's maybe i can sell dimensional reduction harder following on from your uh, comment Jan, by saying that okay if the way I've written it, on the right-hand side, actually, what we've got is a horrible sheaf on a horrible space. Um, whereas on the left, we've got quite a nice sheaf on a slightly less horrible space. Okay, so, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, I, you know, I like the right-hand side because this, uh, this sheaf is Verdier self-dual. And that's, that means that it behaves like it's the constant sheaf on a smooth space in some respects. It's just impossible to calculate. But okay, let me let me let me move on. I think um, this is sort of varying into philosophy. Um, okay, so uh, just this example. Um, let me generalize it. Uh, so it's actually a special case of a general general construction. In the general construction, we start with a quiver, um, not necessarily the Jordan quiver, any old quiver, and we define the tripled quiver by first taking the doubled quiver from a few slides ago. Um, and then adding a loop omega i to every vertex of this quiver. Um, and then the canonical cubic potential is given by just taking the sum over all of the new loops times this element that we've already seen, the sum of the commutators of a and a star for a arrows of the original quiver. So for example, if we started off with the Jordan quiver, then the tripled quiver would have three loops because it would be the doubled quiver plus an extra loop. And this potential just becomes the potential that we've now seen um, a couple of times, uh, the canonical cubic potential. And as before, we define the forgetful morphism to be just the morphism that forgets the action of the extra loops. Um, and as before, the, the function trace of this canonical cubic potential is, is obviously weight one for the scaling action because along the action of um, fibers of pi, because that's the action that uh, scales all of the omegas, essentially. Um, and if you just look at the definition of um, W tilde, it's obviously linear with respect to the omegas. Um, so generalizing the previous example, we get that if we take the <clears throat> vanishing cycles for the canonical cubic potential on the stack of representations of the tripled quiver, and we push them forward, take their direct image along this forgetful morphism, we get something that we really want, which is the dualizing complex on the stack of representations of the pre-projective algebra. So this is going to be our link. This is going to be our way to go from borel moore homology of pre-projective stacks to cohomological DT theory. Um, there's a subscript ver here. So yeah, a couple of times now I've established the convention that on a smooth stack, ver means shift by the dimension of the stack. But of course, this is very far from being a smooth stack, so I have to give you some explanation. Um, here, the shift is given by a tape twist. Um, so this is a shift in, so L, it, it, to recall, L is something that lives in cohomological degree two and is pure of weight two. Um, I take a power of it given by the Euler form of my quiver, which is defined as follows. Um, I, I don't know if I can say anything to motivate this uh, shift, um, except I don't know if this helps, but the, this uh, quantity chi q of d with d doubled is the dimension of the derived stack of representations of the pre-projective algebra. And I hesitate to say that because it might make some people happy to hear that, and it might make some people run for the hills. Um, but if, if that means nothing to you, then it's just a convention. It's just the correct convention. Um, and what's more, you know, we have to we have to supply the right Tate twist to make this isomorphism correct. If I've got the Tate twist wrong, then this isomorphism wouldn't respect cohomological degrees. So another way to motivate this would be this is the Tate twist that makes this isomorphism actually work. Um, okay. So that, that generalizes the sort of dimensional reduction from A3 to A2 to a dimensional reduction from the tri tripled quiver with its canonical qubit potential to the pre-projective algebra.
Okay, so um, just as in the case of uh, cohomological DT theory for quivers with potential, there is an integrality theorem. And in fact, we're just gonna deduce it from the integrality theorem for um, quivers with potential. So we have this uh, commutative diagram of forgetful morphisms. Let me remind you what they all are. Pi is the um, morphism that essentially forgets the action of the extra loops omega. Uh, JH tilde and JH bar are the semi-simplification morphisms. So it's maybe a little bit non-standard to call them forgetful, but that's that's what they are. They're just taking a module and only remembering the semi-simplification of the module. And um, this morphism on the this var pi on the the lower horizontal one is well, it is what it is. It's the morphism that takes a semi-simple uh, representation of Q tilde and spits out a semi-simple representation of Q bar by just forgetting the action of all of the omega eyes, just like the pi upstairs did. Okay, so now, um, yeah, fun and games with commutativity of diagrams. So from the previous but slide, we've got- the question, but this omega bar, is it obvious algebraically that it preserves the semi-simplification? Uh, Which one? I mean, omega bar, the, uh, the bottom horizontal, I mean, if you define it just a morphism between uh, affine JT quotient, so probably <laughs> it's clear, um, but mm -hmm. if you describe them algebraically, it should map semi-simple uh, Jordan Holder sum for something with three loops to the one mm -hmm. with two loops. Is it obvious that it, it is well-defined? Just... Uh, like you say, it's, I mean, the, the quickest and nastiest ways to define it would just be, um... Uh, how would it be that I have a morphism? Hmm. Of course, modular space is probably yeah, it's the easiest way to, to see it. Yeah, yeah, but to show that it maps semi simple. Uh, let's see. Well, on the characteristic of polynomial, it's solved about maybe. Right? Well, you're the Hoder series so that's that's defined. The irreducible may not be irreducible anymore, but you can further. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, that you forget. Right, right, right. right. Uh, okay, so you're pointing out that I've misspoken, <laughs> that um, if I just forget the action of all of the omegas, um, it may not. And, uh, what's that? Um, okay, so this is the morphism that forgets the action of all of the omegas and then semi-simplifies whatever that produces. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But then Thank the you. The yeah, of the diagram. Yeah. Little... yeah, that's good. Okay. So uh, maybe I should have stuck with saying it is what it is because, you know, that's somehow what it has to do. But um, yeah, thanks. That's, that's more precisely what it does. Um, okay. So from the previous side, if I take the direct image along the upper horizontal morphism, this pi forgetful map of the vanishing cycles, I get the dualizing complex of the pre-projective stack considered as a sheaf or a complex on this stack of representations, the doubled quiver, remembering that the stack of representations of the pre-projective algebra is a substack of the stack of representations, the doubled quiver. Um, and so, yeah, like I say, sort of fun and games. Um, if I take the direct image along JH bar of the dualizing complex, that's the same as taking the direct image um, along JH bar of this pi lower star of the vanishing cycles. But now instead of going uh, right and then down, I can go down and then right because the diagram commutes. So um, I do this. Uh, but now I've got things into shape where I can apply the integrality conjecture. So remember the integrality conjecture told us that the direct image along JH tilde, of the vanishing cycles, which a priori is some incredibly horrible mess, is actually the free supercommutative algebra generated by something which is at least a bit more manageable. So here's the exact statement that um, I can replace JH tilde lower star of this vanishing cycles with this free supercommutative algebra where here I have these BPS sheaves, which I defined last time. Um, and then because this uh, var pi commutes with direct sums, it's a monoid homomorphism, I can just formally move this 
uh, var pi lower star inside. So I get that the push forward along JH bar of the dualizing complex, i.e. the thing that in the end I want to push all the way forward to a point in order to define the Brahmor homology, is the free supercommutative algebra generated by something. And that something looks a little bit like the something from the 3D case. Um, we take the BPS sheaf from the sort of 3D guy and push it forward along var pi. And that gives us our kind of stand-in for BPS sheets in the in the 2D case. One but thing that sorry, last time you mentioned the integrality theorem without the potential phi. I am not mistaken. But oh uh, no, no, I think uh, I think I had oh, no no with, with sorry, sorry. Yeah, with I hope. Great. Definitely need <laughs> yeah. it, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay, so remember this BPS Q tilde W tilde D, just for completely general reasons, just more or less by definition, is a um, mixed Hodge module. I, um, it's not a complex, it all lives in cohomological degree zero. Whereas when I take the direct image, it's not so clear. It might, for all one knows, it might be a, a complex. So yeah, this somehow looks less attractive than the 3D integrality theorem, but all the same here it is. That the direct image to the coarse moduli space of the sheaf we care about is the free supercommutative algebra generated by something. But that something is at least reasonably explicit. Okay, but we want to, um, we should try and understand this guy. So uh, we really, at this point, really need to understand the BPS sheaf for triple quivers with their canonical cubic potentials. And especially, uh, what is the direct image of the BPS sheaf along bar pi? because that is the sort of BPS complex in the 2D world. Okay, so um, it turns out we can say quite a lot. Uh, so firstly, a little bit of notation. Let me denote by uh, pi qz, the polynomial algebra with coefficients in pi q. Uh, so um, yeah, it's like the pre-projective algebra, a tensor, uh, um, tensor what? Uh, C adjoins z. Um, okay, so there's an inclusion of stacks uh defined as follows so if i have a representation of the pre-projective algebra i can consider that as a representation of the um doubled doubled quiver and then this z is telling me how all of the extra loops are going to act so i get some closed substack of the stack of uh representations of the tripled quiver this way and what's important about it is that it is the critical locus of the tripled tripled um yeah canonical cubic potential so really this stack of representations of the polynomial algebra with coefficients in pi q, this is going to be the support of the vanishing cycle cohomology. Um, so when whatever the support of BPS is, it's got to live in the image of that support. So in other words, it's got to live in the subvariety of representations of pi q adjoined z considered as a subvariety of representations of the coarse moduli space of representations of Q uh, tilde. So that, that tells us at least a little bit about the support of the BPS sheaf, the 3D BPS sheaf. But the sort of crucial observation is that we can say something much, much, much stronger. Um, so let me define the embedding from the coarse moduli space of representations of the pre-projective algebra cross A1 into this support, into this um, Sub variety of uh, the coarse moduli space of representations of the triple quiver, where I, I cook up a representation of pi q adjoined z from a representation of pi q and an element of a1 by just decreeing that z acts by scalar multiplication by that element. Um, so that gives me a much smaller um, substack. A way of describing it is it's the is it's the sorry sub space. It's the subspace where um, the all of the generalized eigenvalues of all of the omega i's are all the same. So it's a it's like a very small diagonal sitting inside here. And the theorem is that the support of the um, BPS sheaf is in that small diagonal subvariety. So more precisely, there is some mixed Hodge module on the coarse moduli space of representations of the pre-projective algebra such that all I have to do is take the external product of that mixed Hodge module with the constant mixed Hodge module on A1 and include it along this embedding E 
and I get the 3D BPS sheet. Um, so this is, yeah, just some very, very strong condition on the support of the 3D BPS sheet. Um, when uh, geometrically, since you made this analogy between quivers and curves, yeah, mm, uh, this uh, triple quiver, it's like what, like the total space of the canonical bundle to... Mm, it's, the, it's like the total space of um, O plus K, where O is the trivial bundle. Uh, yeah, for Calabi, yeah, it will be just a product. So then this is why I'm a bit confused between the difference between PQ of Z and this uh, Q tilde. Uh, so probably it can be seen only PQ of Z also looks as a product of two-dimensional Calabia with a line. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah. exactly. Um, but that, that is the support of the vanishing cycle. Yeah. So yeah, that is but then, the, but then the that is the modulized stack of objects in the three CY category. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So to recap, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to explicitly calculate uh, the the three D BPS sheaf, but we've got something quite strong about it, which is that there is some mixed Hodge module on the coarse moduli space representations of the pre projective algebra such that um, you just take that mixed Hodge module, take the external products with the constant mixed Hodge module in the extra A1 direction and just include it. So why this is important is remember, we wanted to work out what is the direct image, I've got it written at the top, the direct image of the 3D BPS sheaf along var pi. Um, but that var pi is just gonna collapse off this extra IC A1 factor down here. And we're just going to wind up with something that up to a half take twist is just this mixed Hodge module, BPS pi QD. So one thing this buys us is that um, the direct image along var pi of the BPS sheaf is a sheaf, but um, with a cohomological shift by one, which comes from the, um, the definition of the constant perverse sheaf on A1 here. Um, okay, so... Yeah, recall from a couple of slides back that the direct image of the dualizing complex along uh, the Jordan Holder map is written like this. It's the free supercommutative algebra generated by the push forward of the BPS sheaf tensored with the uh, virtual cohomology of BC star. So this is, remember, it's just the cohomology of BC star shifted by the, uh, with a cohomological shift by the dimension of BC star, so shift by one. From the previous side, the direct image of the BPS sheaf is just this 2D BPS sheaf, but with a half take twist. So if you don't want to think about oh, what that is or about mixed logic structures at all, that just means cohomological shift by one. That cohomological shift by one cancels off the cohomological shift by one in the definition of the virtual cohomology of BC star. So we get the following, that this, um, direct image of the dualizing complex is the free supercommutative algebra generated by the 2D BPS sheaf tensored with the unshifted, unmodified cohomology of BC star. Um, so note that cohomology of BC star, it lives in cohomological degree 0, 2, 4, 6, so on. Um, this BPS pi QD is a mixed Hodge module or a perverse sheaf, depending on your taste. So the thing in big round brackets splits, it's isomorphic to its total cohomology. It's just a direct sum of perverse sheaves stuck in different cohomological degrees. And then when I take sim of it by um, finiteness of this morphism direct sum, it will still split. It will still just be a direct sum of shifted um, perverse cohomology sheaves. So the, yeah, the first component of the decomposition theorem is the statement that this is split. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I need to wrap up soonish. Um, and that's fine, I'll, I'll get to the end of here at least. So the, the splitting um, actually follows from a much stronger statement, which uh, is kind of the main, main point of this talk, which is the, the purity of this uh, direct image. So recall by Saito's theory, if I, if I have a pure complex of mixed Hodge modules, it splits. Um, but purity says something more. It says that the nth cohomology sheaf is a pure mixed Hodge module of weight n. 
Um, so say we want to prove this. We can't, we can't reason in the first section. So remember in the first section, we showed that the push forward of the constant sheaf on the stack of representations of the quiver along the Jordan Holder map is pure using this APM property. Um, but that's not going to work here, actually, because the dualizing complex or the constant complex can fail to be pure. Mm, so then we just can't use the theorem from the first lecture. Um, but it's fine because we still have the following theorem that the 2D BPS sheaf is pure. It's a pure weight zero mixed Hodge module. And then because um, by the integrality theorem, this push forward of the dualizing complex is given by taking the free supercommutative algebra generated by it. The, the purity kind of transmits all the way through to, um, yeah, to show that this is also pure. So let me very briefly give the idea. And I love the idea because it kind of shows the interplay between the 2D and the 3D world. So on the one hand, um, by more or less by definition and commutativity of Verdier duality with um, vanishing cycles, the BPS sheaf is Verdier self-dual. It's isomorphic to its Verdier dual. So in particular, if I look at the ith piece of the weight filtration, it is isomorphic to the minus ith piece of the weight filtration or it's dual. So in particular, if this thing were impure, it would have to um, be sort of impure below. So have uh, negative weights as well as positive weights. It can't just have one, it's got to have both or neither. And if it has neither, it's pure. Okay, so that's what's happening from the 3D world. But then the 2D world, the kind of usual yoga of weights tells us that um, the direct image of the dualizing complex um, is only impure in one direction in the following sense that the ith graded piece of the weight filtration of the jth cohomology is zero if i is strictly greater than j. And then since the 2D BPS sheaf is a sum and of this, um, of the zeroth perverse cohomology or just the zeroth cohomology of this complex, that tells us that the 2D BPS sheaf is only impure in one direction. So in other words, for strictly positive weights, it's zero. So all we have to show is that there are no strictly negative weights for which it's non-zero. Uh, but then we can, yeah, by the support lemma that we had a slide or two ago, we can sort of bring these two things into contact. The thing that's kind of mirror, mirror image impurity is isomorphic to the thing that can only be impure in one direction, tends to something that's pure, the constant mixed Hodge module on A1. So put those things together. The thing can only be impure in one direction. Its impurity is symmetric, so it's got to be pure. Um, okay, so uh, I think I'm more or less happy to stop there since I'm out of time, um, or I can keep uh, going. You can continue a little bit longer. But... Yeah, okay, let's let's do the usual thing that people can just leave and I won't be offended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the same commutative diagram as we had before, this diagram of commutative uh, forgetful morphisms. So remember from last time, there's some extra structure knocking around. There's the um, conservative solomon hall algebra, whose relative incarnation is given by taking the direct image along JH of the vanishing cycle sheaf. Um, and this is an algebra for the convolution tensor structure. Now, if because var pi is a monoid map, I it commutes with the direct sum morphisms. Um, if I take an algebra object in the category of sheaves on MDQ tilde and push it forward along um, var pi, then it will still be an algebra object. Um, in other words, yeah, the direct image along var pi of the relative. Um, conservative Solomon Hall algebra um, is an algebra object, but then playing the same game as we played before, this is really the direct image along JH bar of the dualizing complex. So that's telling us that the thing that um, in the end will push all the way forward to a point to get the borel moore homology of uh, the pre-projective stack um, has an algebra structure. So um, yeah, also we've already seen that this, this guy is split. Um, so from sort of general machinery that I introduced in the first lecture, um, the algebra you get by taking the direct image to a point, I taking the borel moore homology of the pre-projective stack, um, carries a less perverse filtration. It's called less perverse for kind of silly reasons. Um, 
yeah, uh, defined as follows. Um, I just take the i truncation of this JH Barlow, a star of the dualizing complex, and take the hypercohomology of that. And that's the i piece of the perverse filtration. So the, what this is telling us is that the borel mohr homology of the preprojective stack is not just an algebra, where it kind of gets its algebra structure from the conservative Sloman Hall algebra, but it's a filtered algebra, um, where the, the filtration is coming from this less perverse filtration. I should also say that this, um, once I've gone all the way to a point, I am taking borel mohr homology. This is isomorphic to the Hall algebra considered by um, Schiffman and Vassara. Ah, yeah, and hence the name in the, in the title. Um, okay, so uh, I, I want to say, okay, I do want to say something about, to allay the following concern. The concern being, how do we ever calculate anything? This all seems very technical and abstract. And so far, I haven't told you really how to calculate anything. Um, okay, so first things first, the zeroth piece of this filtration is um, the universal enveloping algebra of the BPSD algebra that we met last time. Okay, so how do we calculate that? And in particular, how do we show that this thing isn't um, just a free super commutative algebra? That would be a sort of boring thing to happen, but something we might expect to happen because um, in the case of a symmetric quiver with zero potential, it's the theorem of Efimov that indeed the, the Kohar is free super commutative. So, okay, let me, Give you some, some something concrete to hang on to. Um, this BPSC algebra, it looks like it has a horribly abstract definition that you can never work with, but actually you can prove things about it. Um, so the following theorem, um, yeah, it relates it to the Katz polynomials counting absolutely indecomposable representations of quivers. So it, this algebra, this Lie algebra, has a cohomological rating, and if I take the characteristic function on the left. I, the function who's, for which the coefficient of q to the i over two is the dimension of the i cohomologically graded piece. This is the what's called the Katz polynomial um, evaluated at q inverse. So this counts um, isomorphism classes of absolutely indecomposable d-dimensional representations over fq, where q is obviously has to be a prime power. Um, Okay, so this at least relates the size of this thing to something fairly concrete and almost elementary. Um, but then also we can say something about, we can finally say something about the algebra structure. So there is an isomorphism of Lie algebras between the zeroth cohomologically graded piece of the BPSC algebra and the negative half of the katz moody Lie algebra that you get from Q by just removing all vertices that have one cycles at them. Um, so in particular, this is the first um, indication or proof that these algebras can be uh, non-commutative. Um, okay, okay, let me get through this side and then I'll, I'll just say the conjecture in words. So the, the second theorem um, from the previous side tells us that in cohomological degree zero, the, the thing is what's called spherically generated. Um, we know what the generators of the katz moody lie algebra are and we can just pair them up with um, boring generators in the, on the BPSC algebra. So I've written it here. You take the, the, the piece of the Koha for the dimension vector, which is just zeros everywhere and one in one spot where that spot should be somewhere where there are no loops. Um, okay, so that gives us some somewhat boring uh, generators, but um, what about the others? I mean, if there is any non-zero cohomology in the BPSC algebra, I'm gonna have to generate it somehow, and I'm not going to be able to generate it by taking things that are in cohomological degree zero. So there's got to be something else. And this is where the decomposition theorem really, um, really uh, does a lot of work for us. So we've seen that the universal enveloping algebra, um, which is the zeroth piece of the less perverse filtration, it lifts to this um, mixed Hodge module, which is just the sort of zeroth cohomology of this relative shipman vassar hall algebra. Um, this is more or less by definition. And this is semi-simple by the decomposition theorem or by the proof of purity that I've given you. Um, what's more, it's not too hard to show that if there is a simple d-dimensional module for the pre-projective algebra, then there is a decomposition. So the, the normal game that everyone wants to play when you've um, got the decomposition theorem to play with, i.e. 
you know, you, you show that the direct image of some, some chief uh, satisfies the decomposition theorem, is you start playing around, working out, well, what are the supports of the, of the cohomology sheaves? And, um, you know, can I, can I get hold of the local systems that I take ICs of and so on and so on? That game is quite hard. But here that you get a head start, there's an easy first step, which is that one of the summands is just the intersection complex on the whole of the coarse moduli space of representations of the pre-projective algebra. And then you know, the rest of the summand is something that's very hard to calculate and I don't know how to do it. But this one summand comes for free. You've got the, the intersection complexes in there. What's more, um, the multiplication can't hit that uh, can't hit that summand because the, the the multiplication it all lands on the locus where I have a decomposition of my of my module so it's not going to hit it's not going to have full support um, so put differently the multiplication morphism at the level of sheaves factors through this complement the intersection cohomology um, so what this is telling us is that this summand is somehow primitive that any set of generators for the um, for the sort of algebra given by the zeroth cohomology of this relative whole algebra is going to have to contain these intersection complexes. And if we take derived global sections, we get that this universal enveloping algebra, its dth piece can be written as the intersection cohomology of the coarse moduli space plus something else canonical. So C here stands for canonical or complement. Um, and the multiplication of lower degree pieces in this algebra will factor through C. So this IC is somehow primitive. It, it sort of has to be in any set of generators. Um, yeah, so if I just define HD to be this intersection cohomology, this forms part of a minimal generating space for the universal enveloping algebra. So I'll just get the, I mean, the final slide is just an example slash exercise, which I think is a really sort of fun game to play. And so let me get the sort of last side just on. So I want to get the conjecture down. Um, so I've given you some um, boring generators of the BPSD algebras, the spherical bit. I've given you some interesting generators, the um, uh, intersection cohomology of uh, coarse moduli spaces for D where there exists a simple D dimensional representation. There's a type in between called isotropic, which I've introduced here, um, which um, yeah, comes from uh, dimension vectors D such that um, the Euler form of D with itself is zero. Um, yeah, the definition is here. The conjecture is the following, that those three types of generators generate the whole of the BPSD algebra. Um, and what's more, uh, this Lie algebra is what's called a generalized katz moody lie algebra generated by those three types of generators, where these three generators correspond to the simple roots, the imaginary isotropic, and the imaginary hyperbolic. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's, that's actually fine. I just want to finish by saying the following. We prove purity, we prove this strong statement by sort of um, taking a step back from the push forward of the dualizing complex showing that it's generated by something much more manageable, something much smaller, namely the BPS cohomology, proving that that is pure and then kind of propagating that purity through the whole, through the whole story. This conjecture, if it's true, tells us we, we can actually look at something much, much more um, uh, small, for want of a better word, namely the, the BPS Lie algebra itself is generated by something that in, that will be much, much smaller, will be much, much easier to get hold of. And in particular, can be given explicitly. It's given by intersection cohomology. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this becomes important once we get to where, where we're going in the next talk, which is finally non-abelian Hodge theory. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, uh, thank you. Mm, uh, so uh, any questions? So people are happy. I see many <laughs> in in the chat. Uh, so Ben, uh, 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 so this is pure uh, sort of a clever story, but yeah. as you said, uh, there is a. I mean, it's more general. And for example, if I want to compute this BPS Lie algebras in geometric settings, yeah, like um, I even don't know what to. 
how to say, but it's, uh, if you forget about, actually what I, what I want to, uh, to do is to compute it, not in the framework of two color BR, but three color BR. Uh, 